side of the industry. A quick overview I'm going to go over is what exactly is a technical artist? Uh, what are some of the skills that they require? And so what are some of the ways that they can excel at their jobs? Um, a quick overview of my background. Uh, this is a little bit different for me because I'm coming to you guys as somewhat of an outsider because I'm self-taught, uh, came from the modding community, started doing very uh, early coding experiments with Basic and Visual Studio when I was in middle school. I abandoned that and then later got into the content side of modding uh, with Monster Truck Madness 2 and then picked up the Unreal Engine uh, with Deus Ex, actually, I kind of skipped Unreal 1 because I looked at the VSP editor and thought, wow, that looks really complicated, I can't figure that out. And then a couple years later, got into Unreal and finally Unreal Tournament in 2003. Um, and then I was actually hired as an intern by Epic and Sion uh, when I was 18, about 15 years ago. Uh, and that happened because of a map that I created for the community for Unreal Tournament in 2003, which was purchased and then put in 2004, as an addition map. So that's something to point out because Emily is giving a talk in a few, after a few talks about the internship program. Uh, highly encourage people to get into that because you know it worked great for me. Uh, so I basically started as a level designer because I was really into making maps at the time and I came on to uh, work on level design for Unreal Championship 2. And then I kind of slowly, tra slowly transitioned into environment art and then technical art over the 10 years or so after that initial period. So to kind of give an idea of what technical art is, and this is a really, really crude, missing a lot of uh, areas, but overview of what our team and I think was like when I started around 2003. So we had this kind of gradient of less to more technical, and on the left tends to be artists, um, you know, we have modelers and texture artists, level designers, and notice that it, they tend to get a little bit more technical as you get up to effects artists and animators, because back then those were really the only content people that had to know a lot about specifics about the engine. And then you had engineers who, you know, includes gameplay programmers, graphics programmers, who were covering quite a wide area of technical uh, abilities. And at the time, we actually didn't have a role called tech artist at Epic, although many other studios did have it, and they mostly referred to a technical animator and rigor and things along those lines. Uh, but the point that I'm trying to make here is that, you know, back then we had a few people that were fairly versatile and could kind of jump around within kind of a different grade within the role. And that might give you the impression that, oh, these people can cover this wide area, why do we need to have more roles? But in reality, you know, this one person can jump over there, but they're not actually covering their core responsibilities anymore. Uh, you know, level designers can't spend time polishing up art and lighting too much, so eventually um, new roles are formed based on where people are working a lot outside of their comfort or their specialty. Um, and again, I, I put this kind of off the alignment here to show that tech artists kind of helps bridge the gap between some of the more technical parts of the existing pipeline, like artists, and level designers, and effects artists, and okay, engineers. And I'll be a little bit more specific in that as we go on a little bit. So one of the reasons for you know, this slow change is, you know, 15 years ago things were a lot simpler. Uh, artists didn't really make shaders, they didn't have to know a lot about uh, lighting and things like that, other than in a very classical artistic sense. We were pretty much just making textures, slapping them on what were boxes compared to now. Uh, you know, level designers were just making BSP and placing blocks to kind of offer ourselves as Lego builders back then. Uh, budgets were relatively simple, and, and what I mean by that is you could kind of look at a scene and go to wireframe mode, and you would know right away what's wrong with this scene, what do I fix? Uh, and of course, over the next 10, 15 years, uh, complexity and quality has just dramatically gone up. And that's happened in so many different areas, whereas, you know, instead of just textures now, we have physically based shading, which is a whole can of worms that I'm going to go into right now, but Basically, uh, while artists who do textures and modeling do have to know about that, tech artists are kind of there to help explore the ground truth and kind of explore the whole problem space, working with engineers, prototyping, and making sure things are working as they should. Um, and there's also just an explosion of procedural content creation methods out there. You know, our own blueprints inside of UV4 are a great way to uh, lead into some more complex tools. You know, Zach's going to look at that in the next talk about how blueprints lead directly into uh, full C++ development at the end of the day. Um, programs like Houdini, with you know the Houdini engine, are just adding new ways for people to scale up the content creation. And these are types of things where we don't always have experts in these fields, but we definitely are looking for people who do specialize because they can help fill gaps and help us increase, increase our process as well. And you know, the other big thing is games are now expected to render a vast open world with almost a movie-like quality. So just to do that, you know, there's a lot of different sub little aspects um, that help us need it on. So I mentioned this already, but job descriptions kind of evolve based on needs. Um, and we've seen some of this happening with the recent collision of games and film. Uh, we've started hiring a lot of people in the films industry at Epic over the past couple of years. Uh, you know, I've got new, new friends and co-workers from Pixar, and they've 
you know, because they've had a lot more of this technical quality going on, they tend to have a lot more specific roles that would be kind of under what is our tech art umbrella, you know, shading technical directors, lighting technical directors, pipeline technical directors, and you know, we're not quite there yet in games yet. Uh, a lot of that is currently heading under the tech art umbrella. So there's a lot of different ways technical artists are currently needed. Uh, one of the big ones is prototyping new features. Uh, this can be something as simple as you know making little tool examples for how you make fences in your whole level with blueprints, or testing out a new graphics feature with a rendering engineer who's working on it. But maybe they need a really close feedback loop with someone that can say, "Hey, what are these settings? Is this doing what you think it would do?" And you know, writing up and helping shape the actual direction of the engine. Uh, another big one is optimization, and that one can't be overstated enough. It's not the sexiest one that people say, oh, I want to go to school to learn how to optimize. But in reality, that's one of the ones that can make you really, really valuable to the team because it's what ships games. Uh, the other big one is communication. You know, as, as you kind of saw from that other slide with the big chasm between the, the <coughs> art, art and code, uh, just having someone who can kind of straddle that barrier and help being the liaison to help facilita facilitate that communication. Uh, and the Dev Relations Tech Artist, which is, you know, again, Zach is next talk, is a, is a good example of that. Um, so in general, tech artists should be generalists and have a good understanding of the engine and the, the games that they're working on. Um, but they tend to also have a pretty strong focus in at least one area, uh, you know, such as you know, shading, lighting, procedural work, scripts, you know, being able to write Python or Mac scripts and things like that can be multipliers where you can become the person that does little scripts that help your whole team out. And it's not like any of these things are requirements, but if we see someone's resume that says, oh, I do Mac script, and here's something, the script I actually made, here's what it does, you know, that's the type of thing that sets someone above the, just the typical type of thing you would see. And again, of course, optimization. And so a little bit on prototyping. Uh, being cutting edge requires constant prototyping. Um, you know, a lot of things that tech artists do under this will be, you know, shader experimentation. Uh, that could be as simple as ground truth, ground truth rendering. Pop up in V-Ray, give some known quantity of light, give some known quantity of materials, and then compare it to UE4, and, you know, starting threads with engineers and saying, hey guys, this doesn't look good, what's wrong? What, what are we approximating that we're missing? What can we do to make it better? And that's how a lot of improvements like better skylighting is made it into UE4, you know, tech artists making comparisons and complaining. And you know, it's not like engineers uh, don't know about these deficiencies, but it's more like they need to know which ones are most important to artists so they can prioritize. Uh, and the other is, is uh, tools development. You know, I mentioned that a little bit before, but writing scripts and working closely with the engineers to show feedback. So prototypes often can become real features as well. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out is, you know, with blueprints and materials as they are in before right now, there's times when a tech artist can jump in and prototype something is, is what appears to be a fully developed feature that they can show to the team, show to the engineers, and get everyone on the same page. Um, but then it might actually take several weeks or months to actually make that a real feature that can ship on the game for reasons that are hard to explain. You know, the prototype probably won't be very performant, it won't be cross-platform, among those other things. So, uh, But if you don't have the tech to do that quick prototype, you might never make the full investment for that feature that you really need. So some good skills that are necessary for prototyping, and I think these are foundational for all tech artists, as well as you know, some of the overlap with the gameplay programming and, and engineering is a really solid understanding of trigonometry and vector math. And a lot of this stuff is really great school level stuff that you have to just be proficient in uh, in terms of applied examples. Um, you know, when we're talking about trigonometry and vector math, we're mostly talking about things like dot products and cross products and the ways that we solve intersections and uh, make shaders do cool little things. Um, and it's also important to have at least one traditional category, you know, such as level design, environment art, animation, you know, coding, being really good at tutorials. Um, again, uh, I mentioned this with the Mac script. And um, even for UE4, this is engine specific, but being a really good at blueprints and hooking things together, or even just being really good at handling level streaming. So there's just so many different areas to focus where we don't even fully know everything that we want or need yet. It's, it's expanding all the time. And in the same way where used to have the level design or artist umbrella. Now tech artist is an umbrella that might get further refined in the future. Uh, but this is more to help you guys start thinking about some of those skills and ways to start encouraging students to, to study those things. Uh, optimization ships games. Uh, hitting performance targets is always hard. It requires looking at profile data and trying to make smart choices and then working with artists and programmers. Um, there's times where I'll be meetings with rendering engineers and lead artists Engineers will say, hey, this thing is slow, you cannot use this point light, or you can't use this shadow, and the artists will say, well, that's terrible, it's gonna, we can't sell skins without this light, and then tech artists will say, okay, well, we can do this fake 
shadow thing over here to kind of make you guys both happy. Is that okay? And, you know, kind of helping make compromises. <coughs> uh, simple, some optimization tasks. tasks. Uh, reducing shader cost is a big one, and that just goes hand in hand with general shader knowledge. Reducing scene complexity. Uh, and it also can't be overlooked that you need to have some basic spreadsheet knowledge out there because a lot of optimization is looking through lots of different data points and trying to find uh, things that can be better without making them look worse. And you know, that goes back to my previous point of 15 years ago, you could look at a scene in the wireframe and say, oh wow, this level has 250 polygons, what have you done? <laughs> and, uh, whereas now, that's probably the lowest poly LED for one single static mesh. Um, so there's a lot more areas where problems can go wrong because of the complexity. And you know, doing things like adjusting project graphics settings, so having a knowledge of what the different platforms, and just knowing the difference between the Xbox One and the One X and the PS4 and Neo, just having some of that knowledge, uh, even if you're not the full engineer, having that can help because then you'll understand what these different devices should be able to handle. And profiling is basically learning to use some sort of tools such as uh, Render Doc um, for an Xbox back in the day was Pix. Um, but looking at scene captures and trying to figure out why things are slow and then you know, point those out. And then communication, you know, another big one that I was a bullet point previously. Uh, tech artists are effective as the link between engineers and art. Uh, so along those lines, the more that you have actual programming knowledge, the more effective that link is going to be. So uh, it's not really a requirement that, that a tech artist has programming knowledge. In fact, most tech artists at Epic probably don't accept it. One or two specialties, like we have a script guy. Uh, I do some HLSL shader code. Um, Zach does C++ and Blueprints. You know, we've got to have people in different areas. Um, but just kind of having your area is something that can make you unique about it. Um, and getting in the habit of sharing lots of information, and that includes never being afraid to question some stats. Uh, shipping Battle Royale on mobile, we had stats and daily delta sent out almost every day. And there wasn't a day where I sent an email that was Hey, are you sure this is the right number? That looks wrong. And someone says, oops, wrong build. <laughs> and sends it. So, you know, you have to be diligent in looking over information. Uh, and, you know, breaking down complex things and to make them understandable is, is another big thing for communication. Uh, so, you know, the other important thing is to always have an appetite for learning because, you know, being a tech artist, you're kind of expected to be someone who's <laughs> an engine, knowing what other research and cool things games are doing and reading papers. And just being in that mindset automatically makes you a great learning resource within your company. Uh, you know, people within the company reach out to me all the time. Is this the right way to do this? Is there some cool new thing for this that I'm not aware of? And you know, I'll just point to your hey, there's this paper, there's that, or you know, someone else in the tech art team is doing this type of thing. Uh, and just, you know, since this is a lot of bullet points without a lot of cool pictures here, just some examples of <coughs> stuff that some of our tech artists, uh, including myself, have done. Uh, this one is John Lindquist, who's one of the tech artists who worked on Fortnite for a long time. He made this whole Max script that takes a tree and creates this whole wind hierarchy system um, that allows you to simulate some really accurate wind on the tree itself. And so you know, John is kind of like our, our dedicated Max script expert after that, I guess you could say, to where uh, he told, he's able to do lots of cool little things for us. Uh, and uh, kind of along a similar line, I've done some things with blueprints where Procedural foliage is created by doing things like line traces around the scene and creating meshes and splines, and you know that all goes back to that basic vector map again. You have to know how to connect your points and make them smooth and things like that. Um, you know, finding ways to push the new features, like we recently had volumetrics added to the engine by one of our programmers, Stephen Wright. Um, that was something I was involved in prototyping a little bit myself before, and then with that new version, you know, I was there giving him feedback and finding ways to do cool fog effects like an edited fog inside a Fortnite trailer or, you know, low hanging haze over clouds or over an uh, ocean. You know, these are just some very crude examples. Finding ways to make, you know, fake shading effects. You know, 15 years ago, the version of this was a fake cone with the light beam texture on it, which is kind of the, the first thing that made me think, oh, maybe I, I like these kind of problems. They're kind of fun. And now this is like a more advanced version of that with textures and volumetrics now. Um, and, you know, finding ways to have custom FX implementations, which here is showing an interaction between blueprints uh, and materials and render targets, showing how you can kind of try to integrate a character with lighting and having it impact velocity, which is a, a little clip from the, uh, the Fortnite trailer that we did last year. So that was it for me. Hopefully that was it. Cool.